Hello and welcome back to what is now week four of our Employment Law and Staffing Issues series uh, which I'm conducting with Graeme from Peninsula HR Services and again thank you so much for all your queries and your questions and I'm delighted you're all enjoying this so much and getting so much benefit from it. Our topic today which we've got so many questions on is all about training and I know you commit a lot in terms of investment of money and time to training your teams. So Graeme today the first question we got on training is uh, do I have to provide training courses for my employees? Um, no, I suppose it's the first time that you don't, you don't have to. That being said, if um, uh, certain employees in, in various um, walks of life will need certain basic element um, entry level qualifications that they may need to have, um, so if there are certain services that you're needing them to, to provide, you need to make sure that they are there and at that level. Um, the onus or obligation isn't necessarily on the employer that you have to provide it, um, but you need to make sure if they're providing a certain service that they have that minimum qualification um, as well. So it's a bit of a, a mix in terms of you know, taking on a bit of uh, a kind of getting a, a buy-in from both the employee and also then from the, the employer realising where their, their obligations lie, but also then how they want to maybe go from a best practice right, to push forward as well in terms of developing their staff. Okay. From the work that I do, um, training is actually, if somebody doesn't want to go on training, it's actually the first indication, the biggest indication that morale is slipping and the person's motivation is gone. So, yeah, yeah, that so makes there's, sense. there's all sorts of queries yes. around training. So the next question we got for you is, if I do provide the employees with training courses and my employee leaves my company soon after, is there anything I can do because it is such a heavy financial commitment? Okay, um, yeah, really good question actually. Um, and it, comes back to what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, I suppose, around documentation, policies and procedures. So having a training policy is a really good idea um, because that does give you a little bit of a comeback on it. Um, if you don't have anything in place, no, you don't have any comeback on it um, unless you've, you've put a training agreement in place with that employee. For example, something along the lines of, you know, we agree to fund this course or we agree to fund 25%, 75%, whatever that might be, and the employee will fund the rest. But then that there's an obligation that over the next two years you will stay committed to our salon, our organisation, whatever it might be. Um, and then if you leave in the intervening time before that, that there'll be repayments you know, due to the organisation because we will have power fund. But it, it's getting that in early, getting a training, and training agreement in place so that you actually have something then that we've agreed. Well, we agreed to fund it on the basis that you're going to stay and we're going to see a return out of it as well. So a return on your investment, I suppose, but it comes back to having an agreement in place. Okay, so what I like to do is, is scale it in. So if you leave within um, six months, yeah. we're going to charge 100%. If you leave, if you leave within um, a year, we charge... Is that, is that yeah. feasible? Or if you leave within a year, we charge you 50% of, of, what, of what we paid for you. Yes, and I think that's kind of where it is. It comes back to this kind of vague term that comes out from the WRC, which yeah. you mentioned before, that has an employer been reasonable. And that will come back to as well as, is the agreement reasonable? Um, so like if somebody has you know, maybe work for 18 months or, or whatever it might be and all of a sudden we're still looking for 100% of it back. Is that reasonable? Probably mm -hmm. not. So scaling it in or, or stepping it up, like you were saying, is, is possibly the way to go, um, depending on the course and how big it is or how long, how big an undertaking it might be. But again, ultimately, I'll come back to, I suppose the key thing to remember is, if we don't have something like this in place, well, no, it's not. Then if you've just made that commitment and you've funded it, the employee might go elsewhere and might take those skills elsewhere. Um, but if you have a training agreement in place, that gives you at least some recourse or recall on it. Okay. I get this question quite a lot um, when I'm at the night in salons. I want to send people on training courses. It's for their benefit. Why should I pay for them to go on training? And I hear the other side then staff saying, I really want to do that course, but I work five days a week, and now they're asking me to go, um, go on a training course yeah. day six and day seven at my own expense. I know we're repeating ourselves, but I think... Yeah, um, it, it is difficult. Yeah. And again, some of it comes back to taking a bigger picture view here. You mentioned yourself about yeah. morale and, you know, somebody might be quite happy, but then all yeah. of a sudden you're being asked about their seven, seven day a week, or five day a week turns into a seven yeah. or into next week. It can be difficult, it can be tired, um, whatever that might be. So sometimes an organisation needs to take that bigger picture look to see, well, look, there is a, a bit of a long-term investment in this. This is why we're doing it. Um, it's a development for them, but also for ourselves as an organization we should see a return on this and i think there's uh, we, we deliver a number of different training programs and so on and there's a quote that we use quite a bit from kind of performance management and development and it's kind of a, a discussion between a cfo who's looking at the purse strings and the numbers and a ceo and one of the, the, the cfo raises this question of well what happens 
if we develop our staff and they leave, and the CEO's response is, well, what happens if we don't and they stay? Yes. So there is that kind of look yeah. at it where you kind of have to think about, are we going to actually invest and develop our staff? You know, there might be a bit of a financial aid or a time hit or even on rostering to, to make it to make it work. Um, but sometimes you need to look at it and say, how are we going to set ourselves apart? How are we going to progress? And maybe you will need a little bit of a commitment or investment from the employer side as well. That will then make it a little bit easier to generate the buy-in from the employee as well. Okay. Now, another question that I get following on from this is, um, you know, if, if the training is far away, um, do I have to pay travel costs? Do I have to pay expenses? Do I have to pay loan shares? Do I have to pay subsistence? Um, so, does an employer have to pay all that or not? Yeah, again, it would be one, it, it, it comes back to kind of an agreement perspective. And if you're doing on the one yeah. day, you're going, you're at your employer's disposal, but at disposal, you're available for work, but you've been asked to go to this training course, which you've agreed to do. So they should be paid to go to it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those different courses, there may well be lunch provided mm -hmm. and so on, so that would be covered. Um, but other than that, if, if it's say further than, or, or they have to travel quite a bit to cover it, yes, I would be suggesting you need to cover if there's a, an expense that shouldn't necessarily be at out of pocket or an additional spec expense to go to it. But some of that can again come back to if it's a more longer term program, getting the training agreement in place and you can just set down an agreement how it's going to work, what the commitment is from both sides. If you're looking at those one day type of programs, generally with somebody is available for it, so it's a, it's a work activity, you're getting paid to go to it um, and lunch things can, can vary in terms of whether it's going to be included in it or anything like that and the travel piece if it's further than what it would normally take them to go to work. Um, or consider me for reading or potentially um, travel expenses also. And following on from that, <laughs> if, if if there's a travel, uh, there's a big distance involved, um, does the employer have to pay for the extra hours, like uh, pay the hourly rate if, say, the person normally works nine to five and now they have to leave home and for travel like that stuff for travelling to training? Uh, no, you're probably going to be okay once you've covered from their, their, your, once they're going to the course and they're there and you're covering their expenses to get there. That's what you're looking at in terms of that series. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, I hope that um, answers all the questions you were sending in to us today about training. And uh, next week is really interesting, so please keep your questions coming in. We're going to talk about protecting your business and protecting the employer next week. So I know that's really going to be of interest to you. So look forward to seeing you again next week. Mm -hmm.